Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, um, Thursday morning, March the, the 10th. I'm happy to be, to be here. This is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And chat room is open, and I did pop the link in, in there to what we're talking about on Tuesday and uh, Tuesday morning. And so, yeah, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, um, we're discussing a, a, a it's a website it's from mudrashram uh, dot com www dot mudrashram dot com and it is uh, regarding dysfunctional families and this one particular portion of this article is uh, or this website is uh, talking about boundaries so that's what we're looking at um, and so hopefully people are getting something out of this I know that I am every time I it's just a learning uh, it's, it's 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 a learning tool for me this stuff and and I. You know, I find it very helpful for myself. So hopefully, other people are getting something out of it. Um, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. I'm not a counselor or therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my own blog talk shows, and you know, just wanted to be another voice out here speaking out against abuse, and you know, t- just 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 raising my voice. You know what I mean? To just you know break the silence, right? The issues of child abuse is, you know, the the main reason why it, we can't seem to solve the issue and stop child abuse is silence, right? Uh, everybody wants it silenced. And it's like, you know, the more we talk about it, the more uh, society realizes, hey, this is a this is a real problem. And it, it's not a, it's not some a pretend, make-believe thing that kids are going through. This is real. And this is a lot of children's realities. I, I also wanted to be a voice for survivors, right? So um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I appreciate it. You have to listen at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse. And abuse is a very sensitive topic. And most people find it uncomfortable. So... I don't mind talking about it because it's how I grew up and I just, you know, my whole life has been uh, really a struggle, you know, because of the abuse. So I don't mind talking about it, but I know a lot of people, you know, have a problem discussing it, even hearing things about abuse. So you have to listen at your own discretion and know that, you know, what's good for you to listen to, really, it's up to you. Um, You know, you, you would ultimately be the best person to make that choice for yourself so if you're a survivor and you're just starting out on your healing journey you know you got to be careful when you listen to stuff like this just make sure you're in a safe enough place that you know you won't hurt yourself or hurt somebody else and be triggered by the information as well as other people listening it may make you uncomfortable so you you listen at your own discretion and young people under the age of 18 i just ask that you have permission to, to listen to my shows i'm the canada regional director for dream catchers for abused children and you know we're promoting awareness and education regarding child abuse and trying to save children's lives really uh to protect children and so you know it's very important that young people know how to keep themselves safe online and so you should have permission when you listen to something like this and make sure that it's okay for you, age appropriate. You know, I'm not sure how young the people are who are listening to my show. So um, I want everybody under the age of 18 to have permission to listen to my show and have an adult or someone in your life, uh, hopefully you have a caregiver that, or parent that cares about what you're doing online and you can have them listen to a show with you and see if it's something that they feel is appropriate for you to listen to. Because there's a lot of adult content on my shows and, um, you know, the topics of abuse are very sensitive and people might... Young people might not have heard some, you know, a whole lot about it. So, you know, it could be, you know, kind of scary for some people, and and depending on how young the the people are who are listening. So, so make sure you have someone listen to the show with you, and they can help you make a decision whether you should be listening or not. So, thanks everybody for being here. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to get right into this topic here this morning, and this is all to do with boundaries, and that's where we left off on Tuesday. And I'll just give you the actual website. This is www.mudrashram.com, M-U-D-R-A-S-H-R-A-M, mudrashram.com, forward slash dysfunctional family 2, the number 2, dot HTML. And the, this was written by George A. Boyd in 1992, So, it, but it doesn't matter because the information is... is uh, it's it's the same as it would be today if somebody was doing a study on boundaries. You know, it's just it's a it's a good article and I think that it's worth looking at. So it's when you grow up in a dysfunctional family, that's what it's titled. It's from the Mudrashram Institute of Spiritual Studies and this particular article from George A. Boyd is really talking about healthy families, dysfunctional families and taking a look at both and and what it, what it, what it is the differences between them and as well as uh boundaries and whatnot. So that's what we're looking at. So even if there was no abuse in the home and it was just dysfunctional, you know, uh, you know, because not every dysfunctional home would have abuse. It's just that some do, and so you know, some lots of people have probably grown up in dysfunctional homes and uh, take on these roles and these different, you know, life scripts and roles that that are unhealthy. You know what I mean? And and issues with boundaries and 
you know, the lack of boundaries, uh, not knowing how to set proper boundaries. And that was my, my, my issue, you know. I mean, I'm, like, we did not grow up with proper boundaries, like none of my siblings. So, you know, we didn't learn that as children or even as young adults. So we had to, we have to, we have to do this work now and learn, you know, learn this stuff. So it's not, it's a learned behavior. It's something that you would learn from, from your parents or from your caregivers, whoever's looking after you. Right? And so it's important to get this information later. If you haven't, if you, if you, if you didn't get this stuff, because it does affect your adult life many, many times. It, it, different degrees and to different, you know, varying degrees and different ways. Obviously, nobody's the same because we're all different, but it does, it is an issue. And I know when I read this stuff, I'm like, yep, I can totally see, you know, what happened in my family and why why we have such issues with boundaries, right? So this is a really quite quite a good article. We're about halfway through here. We left off yesterday where they were saying, uh, George A. Boyd was writing and he says, another priority for recovering adult children from these dysfunctional families must be to rebuild appropriate boundaries and he said they must relearn what is appropriate sexuality and what are legitimate ways to express displeasure or anger without injuring others or themselves. They must re-empower themselves to say no to relationships that they do not want and that are not good for them. Uh, no to demands that are they're not able to handle. Because quite often, people who are growing up, you know, in dysfunctional homes or, or even abusive homes, you know, as children, they uh, they might take on a behavior where they don't think they can say no you know they they think that they have to do what everyone tells them to do and even as an adult they carry that into their adult life and quite often you know their own needs are not being met because they're just doing what everybody else wants them to do they don't know that they can say no to some things that they don't want to do you know what i mean that you know i think that's a huge issue with people who've been abused and who you know were not shown that growing up that there's certain things that you know, you can you have a right to kind of say no to. You know what I mean? Especially if it's hurting you. You know what I mean? Um, that's the whole issue. You know, with with uh, especially child sexual abuse. You know, many survivors of child sexual abuse that I the stuff that I've read and, and have known about uh, is that you know they don't know that they have a right to their own body. You know, their own personal uh, choice that they could say no if somebody touches them and they don't want somebody to touch them. They have the right to say no, and that's a huge issue with a lot of people who have been abused. Uh, sexually, you know, because they they were not allowed to say no as children, so they feel like they don't even realize that they can say no as an adult. And these are boundaries that we need to learn to set. There's all kinds. I mean, this is just one example, but there it's a huge issue because it, it does affect your adult life. And I was talking about yeah, Tuesday morning was talking about my sister because she's just a good example. I mean, poor thing, like she, but she just you know she doesn't know how to set boundaries, so she just lets people. Um, sort of take advantage of her, lets people use her, and she's a really nice person. So, like, she's a really good person. My, my sister is, um, I'm, I'm not talking to her right now just because I'm sort of cut the family off, but that's just my choice. But the the thing is, is she is a really good person and, um, you know, would do anything for anyone, uh, but she grew up in the same home I did. And so, you know, she she got into a couple of relationships. She's only had a couple of real relationships that went on, you know, any length of time, like for years. And they were both abusive. And one was physically abusive as well as everything else. And, 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 and she divorced that guy. And then this other relationship she had for seven years was really with a man who just wanted to meet his own needs and had no interest in her, her needs. And so he took advantage, complete advantage of her. And um, she she didn't know how to get out of the... To, to end the relationship because she she cared about this guy so she was willing to let this guy treat her like that but well, and we grew up watching this happen really in our own family with with because of what, what our mother did because our mother put up with this abuse from our dad for forever and you know she had the opportunity to get out she could have got out she she could have uh you know got herself some help and got her children some help and so you know when people you know, you grow up seeing this kind of thing. You may not know how to set boundaries. And so I think boundaries are really important. And I know myself, I'm always kind of looking at, you know, this information and finding it very helpful. And George A. Boyd says that um, they must rehabilitate their ability to trust, to feel and share their feelings, to self-disclose and establish intimate relations. So that's people that would be recovering, uh, recovering adult children from dysfunctional families, right? must um, rehabilitate, rehabilitate their ability to trust, to feel and share their feelings, 
to self-disclose and establish intimate relations. And I think, you know, trust is a huge issue for, for a lot of people, you, you know, to be honest. I mean, people say, well, I, I need to learn how to trust. My issue was is that I wanted people to trust me, you know what I mean, that I was a trustworthy person. And so I thought, well, if I want people to trust me, then i got to give everybody else a benefit of the doubt and, and, and try to learn how to trust other people, you know what I mean. Um, but really, honestly, you really can't trust anybody. Um, I don't know why people think that, you should just trust everyone because you can't trust everyone. <laughs> That's a whole issue out there, and there are good people and there are bad people, and you sometimes don't know, uh, you know what I mean? You don't know what you're getting into because somebody portrays themselves to be a good person and turns out to be a bad person. That you know, that's the whole issue. It, people are just who they are, you know what I mean? And everybody has the ability to hurt everybody, but I think that there has to be a certain amount of um, being willing to, you know, to trust somebody, especially if your if your gut instinct feels that this person is decent and a good person and would not hurt you on purpose and this sort of thing. I mean, I like, I want people to trust me. I mean, I, you know, so I figure, hey, i got to try to learn how to trust that other people, you know, are who they say they are and they're not going to they're not gonna hurt me too, you know what I mean, in, in different types of relationships, whether that's friendships or, um, you know, uh, well, you know, I'm with my sweetheart now who I've been with for, for 16 years, but, I mean, I had to learn how to trust him, you know, and I even left him for a year because I didn't trust him and, uh, got back together and really enforce, reinforced this, the 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 idea that we were not going to hurt each other, and if we were, there was the door. You know what I mean? Because I just I just decided I just didn't want to take any more abuse as an adult. I was tired of it and really needed to have a, 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 you know some sort of peace in my life. You know, um, and I thought, no way am I going to go from the hellhole that I grew up in, um, this war zone hellhole that my parents created for us. Uh, into an adult situation where that's going on, you know what I mean? Like I thought, no, I can't have it anymore. I'll, I mean, I'll, I don't know what I would do. Just go ballistic, or I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like I can't take any more abuse from anybody. So I was just like, I told him, and uh, this was meant about 15 years ago. But I mean, I had to set some boundaries right there, and I did a whole lot of, you know, thinking about, you know, the fact that I was not going to allow anybody to come into my life and abuse me and mistreat me. And if they did hurt me, they were going to make it right. And they were not going to do it again. You know what I mean? Because people do sometimes hurt people. You know what I mean? In relationships, you know, they say things that are hurtful or do something that hurts that person. And, and you know, really, it is up to up to us as survivors of abuse to make sure that we're not revictimized. And in order to do that, you have to set clear boundaries. You know, of what you're going to allow in your life, how you know what you're going to allow as far as allowing someone to treat you a certain way. You know. And I know that I just did not want to take any more abuse from anybody. I was like, no, I'm not living this whole existence of mine on the earth with abusive people. I already I was stuck with an abusive family, so now it's you know my choice to to you know have a decent you know re- decent relationships with people as an adult, right? And so I really made a conscious effort to not allow abuser types into my life. You know what I mean? And and it's worked. It's definitely worked. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of of friends, you know what I mean, because of it, because I'm very choosy about who I hang around with. Uh, I have a good friend here with me here this morning from Australia. Hello, Gypsy Witch. Um, but the thing is, is you know, people, you know, you can't trust everybody, right? So I mean, that's just the issue. There will be people out there that will that, that have the potential to hurt us, you know what I mean? But we have to. If you set the boundaries, you'll notice when they cross the line, and you'll be like, okay, no, I've already set a boundary that I'm not going to allow anybody to abuse me as an adult. So. Um, there's the boundary, and that person's doing whatever they're doing, so I'm going to have to address it. You know what I mean? Either get out of the relationship or tell them, you know, how you feel, this type of stuff, and let them know that you're not taking any abuse. You know what I mean? Well, that's what I did, and I just put my foot down and uh, literally told my partner that I, you know, my sweetheart, that I was not taking any more abuse from anybody. And if he had any ideas that he was going to abuse me, there was the door, you know, as I was serious. And uh, some people are so afraid of not, of being alone that they will allow themselves to be abused. And I know that's an issue with a lot of people. And I didn't care. I was like, I'd rather be on my own than be abused. You know what I mean? Because it, at least I have a, de- a decent, peaceful life going on, uh, even if it means that I am on my own or alone. But this this guy, you know, he turned, he, he loved me, and we worked it out, and, and we're still together, very much together. And, and he, he's terminally ill, so we don't live together anymore. But, um, you know, we had a great relationship. Because we set boundaries. He set boundaries, I set boundaries, and we said, this is what we're going to allow. This is what we're not going to allow. And let's do this right. Let's treat each other right. This is what, you know, healthy relationships, you know what I mean? Like, I I really 
uh, think that adult survivors of, of child abuse and, and abuse and, and uh, dysfunction really have to go back and, and, and learn what is a healthy relationship because that's the issue. <laughs> you know what I mean? We cannot, you know, as adults, continue to be re-victimized <clears throat> or allow people to treat us horribly, you know, just because we don't know how to say no or we, or we don't want to be alone. You know what I mean? That's, to me, a very sad excuse for allowing somebody to abuse a person, right, just because they don't want to be alone or they're afraid of being alone sort of thing. And I know it does happen. I've talked to people who have, who've been in that situation, right? And me, myself, I'd rather be alone than be abused. You know what I mean? I'm just not taking any more garbage off of anybody, right? So that was my issue. But, you know, everybody's different. But I think, and also to the ability to feel and share their feelings. That's the issue. You know, many times people growing up in dysfunctional homes, abusive homes, are not allowed to share their feelings. They're not allowed to talk about what, how they feel and how the other person's made them feel. You know, it's not like, you know, most children growing up, in, and I'm talking about abuse. I'm not talking about a normal functioning home. I'm talking about children who would be experiencing, you know, physical abuse probably as well as verbal abuse and, and some emotional psychological abuse in there because there always will be whenever there's physical abuse or child sexual abuse going on um, or even verbal abuse. It, it's very hard on a child. So abuse is coupled with the psychological and emotional damage that's done as well, right? All of it. So, you know, no, children generally can't say, well, you know, mom or dad, I just don't like what you're doing to me and I don't, I don't appreciate you beating on me or sexually using me. You know, most children cannot talk to their abusers, which would maybe possibly be their family members, like a parent or, uh, you know, someone in the home who's abusing them, they're not going to be able to normally express their feelings and say, look, I don't like how you're treating me and the other, or, or and my siblings or, you know, whatever, the, because the, there likely will be some abuse following that, you know what I mean? I, we were not allowed to open our mouths about the way we were being treated, I know that. Um, growing up in the home that I grew up in, as soon as I opened my mouth about some of the treatment that I saw going on between my dad and my brother's, I would generally be beaten because my parents didn't want to hear what I had to say about the way they were, quote-unquote, disciplining their, their children, right? So, I mean, I, I, I'd i be like, you know, sitting on the couch, you know, yelling at my dad to stop hurting my hurting my brother, right? I'd be, you stop hurting my brother, and I was like four or five years old. And, you know, then I would be beating for opening my mouth. We were not allowed to to have any feelings or, dis, or, or discuss our feelings or, or, you know, announce our feelings on how we were feeling about how people were being treated in the home. So as children, right? So when you grow up like that, you know, you just generally keep all your feelings to yourself. Um, a lot of people who have been abused are like that because they're not allowed to express those feelings. So then as an adult, you know, we have to go back and learn, you know, how to do that, how to feel and how to how to, to share our feelings, right? And to self-disclose and establish intimate relations. I mean, it's hard for people, um, you know, to, to be able to... to trust enough and, and and share enough of how they're feeling just to be in an intimate relationship. It's uh, sometimes, you know what I mean? Like I've been, uh, when I when I met the man that I'm with right now, um, you know, I, I had a huge, I was I was really the type that was like, okay, I'm not really interested in a relationship. I just, I just liked him, you know what I mean? But I wasn't looking for long term because I wasn't interested in marriage. And I wasn't interested in, in, in any kind of long term thing because, to me, that just meant um, that I might be stuck with an abuser, right? So, because marriage, to me, that's that's what that means to me. I because I grew up in this dysfunctional, highly volatile, violent home, with watching my parents fight all the time, right? So I thought, oh man, I do not want to be married because I want to be able to leave. Like so, I, I, I you know, this whole idea of being married to somebody and being stuck in this marriage was just a nightmare thought to me, and so you know, I just. I, I was more the type that would just be like, no, let's just have fun and enjoy each other, and then you know we can just leave, right? If we don't, and we'll just motor our own way. I really didn't want that whole longevity, uh, long relationship type stuff. You know what I mean? And so it, it was. It's hard to get close to somebody like you know when you when you're not planning on sticking around. You just you know learn to build those relationships and learn how to deal with stuff. So I had no clue how to properly be in a relationship. Uh, and my sweetheart that I'm with now, you know, he, he, you know, he, he's, he, he was not abused as a child. And so he was kind of wondering what was going on with my behavior because I was always, you know, one, one, I was either passive or I was aggressive, you know what I mean? But I was having a real hard time 
balancing the whole thing, right? Because I wanted to, I, you know, I cared for him, I loved him, and he was he was the guy that I thought, hey, I could spend the rest of my life with this guy. But yet, part of me did not trust him, and the other part of me wanted to trust him, and I, but I couldn't trust him, and I had huge issues, couldn't really allow myself to get close to him and allow him to get close to me. And so the relationship was really suffering in the first couple of years. But we we did work it out, and that's because I told him, I, I sat him down and I said, look, buddy, we're going to have a long, long chat after we had broke up for a year. And I said, we, you know, I told him what was obviously what was going on, and I said, look, I was abused, and, I, you know, I need s- some support. I really do. And I need to know that you are not going to abuse me. I need to know that right now. Because if if you think you're ever going to abuse me or hurt me, there's the door. You can get up and you can go right now. Because if you do, you will be out of here. You will be out of my life so fast, you know. And I said, so basically I'm just setting boundaries and I need you to know how I feel. And so I had never done that before and I really didn't even know how to approach the whole thing. I had no idea how to be in a healthy, functioning relationship, right? So it was. So he was my guinea pig, really, and we're still together and he, he uh, he's a very good man. He put up with a whole lot of dysfunction in, in me. Uh, in order to help me out, you know what I mean. And he's the type of guy that was—he's uh, just easy going. So he's just—he's uh, happy he's with the relationship, and he was okay with the way that I felt about things and, and giving me that room because I couldn't—I couldn't deal with being smothered. I couldn't deal with having having to be trapped in this relationship. So he's given me a lot of freedom and a lot of room, um, which I needed. Right? I needed to be able to to feel free. Uh, and not be smothered and not be surrounded in, in this feeling of being stuck in this thing, you know. And so it's it's worked out, you know what I mean? But that's just because he was willing to um, to work with me on stuff and, and not suffocate me in the relationship or try to make me somebody that I want. And, you know, he's just allowing me to be me. <clears throat> I think that's very important to find somebody in your life that is willing to just accept you for who you are and help you, um when you need help, you know, and and uh, and just be there for you. That's basically what he's done. So it's great. But the thing is, is not everybody will do that or, or can do that, and that's very sad. Uh, many people just end up being re-victimized and, and, and re, you know, just more abuse on top of more abuse, you know, abused as a child and then abused as, as an adult. And that's exactly what happened to my mom especially, right? So that's why I, told, I said I'm not doing that. I just refuse, right? So... We have to make. We have to set these boundaries. We have to know. You know what I mean? What kind of a relationship we want, and we have to know what's good for us. We have to know what we want out of out of this life if we're going to actually um, be able to sort of establish the perimeters. You know what I mean? Of of how we're going to let people treat us. So this is very important. This stuff, right? They said that uh, George A. Boyd said that uh, they must establish the ability to think for themselves and to make their own decisions. Uh, confusing and scary as that might be. And so just thinking for themselves and making their own decisions. And that's a, you know, when people grow up in dysfunctional homes, sometimes there's these roles that they take on where they codependency and whatnot, um, if, the, if there's a lot of codependency within the home, then their own thoughts, they, they won't even have their own thoughts. You know, the children will be thinking about the parents and the parent, the, the children will be thinking about the, the parents' needs, not their own. And the, the children's needs will probably not be being met. And so they will learn as a child that their own needs don't count and that the only thing that does count is what the what the uh, family wants. So quite often they, as an adult, you know, we take this on as an adult role where we'll say, well, everybody else's needs comes first. My needs don't even count. And so you don't even think about what your needs are. Uh, you're just thinking about what other people's needs are. So your needs always are just not being met. And, of course, with that comes a lot of... Um, um, just unsatisfaction, you know what I mean? Just knowing that everybody else's needs are being met, but what about, you know, where where do your needs fall into this? And I think it's, you know, that's just something, you know, that sort of leftover stuff from codependency and uh, not being able to make decisions, you know what I mean? Not being able to, to think for yourself. That's a huge issue, you know what I mean? Um, I didn't have too many problems with that because I was sort of never, I didn't have a bond with my parents. So I, the, only, the only reason I ever tried to get into their head was just to avoid the abuse. You know, I did care about them, but it's just that I, you know, I wasn't like we had this special family bond, right? I mean, we, um, I didn't really pay much attention to, to, I don't know. It's, you know, I, the only reason I would actually pay attention to what was going on was just because just to avoid abuse, you know. So if my mom was depressed or angry, then of course I, I was right away paying attention to her behavior and how she was feeling and whatnot. But otherwise, we didn't have a special family bond where we sat at the table and ate dinner together. 
um, or did things together, and then they would abuse us. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we had no bond. <clears throat> there was no bond there. So, you know, there was no um, let's hang out as a family for two weeks and then the abuse starts again sort of thing. Like we never had a, uh, a real family, a normal family existence. So when I, I grew up kind of on my own and I kind of had to make decisions for myself because I had to, you know, my, my mom was not doing a lot of things that she should have been doing for me, which was to help me uh, learn how to take care of myself and learn how, to, you know, to um, even just to you know, hygiene, you know, things like, I mean, I grew up completely abused. So, you know, my, my mom didn't care if I was brushing my teeth, having a bath or or taking care of myself at all, you know what I mean? So as a child, there was nobody showing me how to do this stuff. My sister, who's five years older, was gone most of the time. So I was in the house really basically on my own with a bunch of older brothers who were on drugs, right? So I didn't really learn <clears throat> anything that was really any healthy, right? <clears throat> so I made my own decisions. I had no problem doing that. <laughs> they weren't always the right ones, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, the, the, I, I guess I was able to, to do a little bit of thinking for myself because I didn't have somebody thinking for me all the time. I just had to be always on the lookout and alert for abuse and, and people in the room. It depended on who was in the room. And, like, if, if my parents were both in the same room at the same time, that that was an issue. And so, if but if my mom was in the kitchen and my dad was somewhere else, and then, you know, you kind of relax a little bit. But if, you know, if the two of them got together in the same room, it, it could be a problem. So it was kind of, kind of kept an eye on who was where, if you were in the house and sort of thing. And uh, coming in, you know, from, from outside, you know, you just never know what you're going to be walking into. But um, I kind of didn't have people thinking for me because nobody was paying much attention to me at all except for to abuse me. So that's the issue. Uh, people were, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So as long, you know, if I wasn't there or I was just, you know, sitting quiet somewhere, you know what I mean? Uh, hiding away somewhere, then, you know, nobody really paid much attention to me at all. Uh, if my mom was having a bad day and didn't like something I was doing, then she would abuse me. So it was not a healthy environment. Like, there was no no healthy stuff in there in between, you know what I mean? So I grew up in a very bizarre situation. But um, making our own decisions, you know, I, I've never really had a problem with that because I've had to my whole life, you know, to make the decision. You know, my, my parents were not the type, like, here, honey, I'll get you off to school, and, you know, we'll get you some new clothes, and we'll just, here, look, you can wear your new suit, you know, you can wear your new outfit, you know, you can wear a new dress or whatever. Like, you know, I mean, I, I had, I was, I quite often went to school in my pajamas, because my, I, I used to have these long dress pajamas that my mom would make for me, and I would just wear those to school, right? And so, you know, my, nobody was really looking out to, to see what was hap what was going on with me, right? So, um I used to make my own decisions. They just weren't. They, they were from the age of like seven years old, eight years old, six years old. You know, they weren't the greatest decisions, but I still made them. And sometimes I paid for them for sure. Uh, they must reown a coherent and meaningful set of moral values by which to govern their lives and to take responsibility for their behavior. That's people growing up, adult children of, uh, from dysfunctional homes. Must reown a coherent and meaningful set of moral values by which to govern their lives and to take responsibility for their behavior. Absolutely, that's important. And I think that's we're, we're going to have to leave off here pretty much because we've only got a couple minutes left. But that's really um, huge for pe people who grew up, in, who you know, may have grown up in dysfunctional, abusive homes. Uh, you know, you have to learn these morals and, and, and values. And, you know, if you weren't shown this stuff, then you got to get it from somewhere, you know. And I know growing up in the home that I did... Um, the norm was was abuse. The norm was violence. The norm was hurting people. The norm was watching people suffer. You know, uh, whether it was my siblings or my mom or or even my dad. My dad was uh, schizophrenic. He was always uh, paranoid that the devil was com coming for him. Or, you know, he's quite quite often trying to kill himself running down the freeway. And of course, I felt bad for my whole family. I mean, everybody within the family was suffering. And you know, it's but when you grow up like that, then you go and you go stay at somebody's house who seems to be quite normal um just like a normal family would be people would consider them to be normal uh healthy relationships right um you notice the difference it's like wow look what's going on over here nobody's nobody in this home's hurting their children nobody in this home's hurting each other nobody's sitting around crying and talking about killing themselves running down the freeway and then I, i'd go back home and i'd be like yeah look at this mess you know what i mean so i started to realize you know especially as a teenager the difference between my home and other people's homes, you know what I mean? And I'd be like, wow, you know what I mean? There is a huge difference, right? And um, so we do have to learn, you know, how to 
you know, sort of see the right and the wrong. What's right, what's wrong, right? Uh, so many times people grow up in these abusive, twisted environments, and your thinking is not going to be right. You know what I mean? It's like unless you get some help with it, right? I know for myself I had huge issues as a child, you know, um, and had to really watch normal people to try to get that information. So thanks, everybody, for being here. I'll be back on tonight with my show, uh, Child Abuse Prevention, Human Rights Abuse Prevention. It's up to us. And then as well, Dreamcatchers Talk Radio. Um, we'll be talking about family violence tonight on Dreamcatchers Talk Radio. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. You know, if you're a survivor and you're just having a, lo- a hard time and you just think, I, I don't know how I'm going to get help and I can't cope, you know, and, and there's nobody around to talk to because quite often that's the case, you know, you call somebody. You call a crisis line. You call somebody. But you make sure that you get some help and you stick around, you know. Like, we certainly deserve so much better, and we certainly did not deserve to be treated that way as children. No child ever does. You know, that's why I fight to stop child abuse, right? But, um, you know, there's so many survivors. I, I know there are, and I, I know so many myself. And um, and always have known lots of survivors. And we certainly did not deserve that. And, you know, it's up to us as adults if we're going to have a good life. We really have to be... We have to be the ones that, that uh, to do this for ourselves. Nobody else can do it. I, I was waiting for somebody else to do it for me. Uh, I waited to the age of 41. And, you know, that's really ridiculous that I, I just didn't realize that it was going to have to be me to do all this work. I thought somebody could come into my life and just make it better. And, you know, and and they, how could they? You know what I mean? They, they, there's no way anybody could come back and, and undo the damage that was done to me as a child. That all has to come from within me. It has to be a serious effort that I want to heal, that I want to get that I want to have a good life and experience good things and allow good people in my life and allow myself to enjoy this life um, and move, you know, and be able to move through some of this stuff, you know what I mean? So even if you don't, you know, disclose the abuse to anybody and you never tell anybody, um, do some self-help then, you know what I mean? But make sure that you stick around because for people to destroy their lives because they were abused as children makes me very angry because... I was headed down that road, and my brother killed himself, and uh, another one of my brothers died of a drug overdose. And, you know, I was headed down the same road, right? I was always planning my suicides and, and thinking, well, I could, I need out of this pain. You know what I mean? How am I going to get out of this pain? And, and you know, as a child, I was just doing drugs, right, up until the age of 21, and I decided to, to, to straighten myself out because I didn't want to end up on the streets dead from an overdose. But the thing is, is, you know... I, this self-preservation thing's just always kicking in, you know what I mean? So I realized, I thought, man, if it's going to be, I'm going to have to do this. Nobody can do this for me. And so if I let the abuse that I suffered as a child, if I let my parents destroy destroy me, you know, that's, that they win the fight, you know? And that makes me mad, that makes me mad you know what I mean, when people give up and, and the abusers win. Like, that's what I'm saying, you know, we have to, we have to fight this thing and we have to live and we have to, win this battle and that's what I decided to do I was like no way are my parents going to win this fight I'm going to win because I'm going to have a good life and I'm going to care about myself and I'm going to love myself and I'm going to learn how to love and care about other people and trust people and I'm going to learn how to have a normal happy existence here on this planet and it's just going to be such a huge slap in my parents face because they couldn't destroy me you know and so that's my ba- that's my fight and I and I, I, we, I hope everybody will do it no, don't give up. Not ever, ever. You know what I mean? It's so important that you don't give up. And if you have to, you call a crisis line anonymously and just say, I need help, you know, um, whatever. But make sure you do phone somebody and get a hold of somebody, right? And, and don't allow yourself to, to, to suffer on and, uh, but, you know, and just feel that there's no hope because there is. And, you know, but it is ultimately up to us. We can't sit back and use the excuse, well, you know, it's like, no, it, it is up to us. We we have to do it ourselves, and um, it's a lot of work, and it's it, but it's it's worth it. It is so worth it. I hope everybody will stick it out, so make sure that you do get some help, right? So have a great day, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Take good care. Bye-bye.